You can cut through here if you want to, Hoss. You don't, that way you won't get quite as well. Okay. All right. All right. Titus chapter number 2. Titus chapter number 2. And we'll pick it up here in Father, bless your word here this morning and sure do appreciate it. And thank you for being so good to us. I pray that you might help us as we discuss these matters uh, to learn from the things that you're trying to show us out of these passages. Help us to recognize that we're very clearly uh, winding some things up, whether or not it's before you come or not. We can't really say for sure, but uh, we would ask that you would come get us quickly. In the meantime, keep us strong, keep our eyes upon thee and help us to be able to have a good account before Thee in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Now this passage here in the book of uh, Titus has to do with sound doctrine. It starts off here in verse number 1. And then he lets you know that sound doctrine is not just a bunch of words on a page or biblical doctrine in the sense of dispensations or in the sense of salvation by grace through faith or the blood atonement or eternal security. One of the things that he's trying to get across to you here is, is that sound doctrine in this passage has to do with a manner of conduct. And that continues to stay all the way through there. As a matter of fact, he's going to talk to you about uh, adorning the doctrine of God, meaning that when you adorn the right attitude, when you have the right uh, lifestyle, the right way of living, it causes the Word of God not to be blasphemed. Now blaspheme doesn't mean like a lot of people try to teach that you blaspheme the Holy Ghost and that that means that you accuse anybody that speaks in tongues of uh, being it of the devil. Blasphemy in uh, Mark chapter number 3 has to do with Jesus Christ being present and them accusing Jesus Christ of doing the miracles that He does through the devil. To put yourself in that kind of a blasphemy puts you in the on par with Jesus Christ. That would mean when Benny Hinn or Kenneth Copeland or uh, Ernest Ainsley or any of the older guys that did that, Catherine Kuhlman and all them and the ones that are doing it now, they speak in tongues and if you speak out against that from a doctrinal position, they say you're blaspheming the Holy Ghost. No, you're not blaspheming the Holy Ghost. That one has to do with telling Jesus Christ the miracles He's performing are being performed again uh, with the power of the devil. There's two other forms of blasphemy there in the Bible. One of them has to do with a woman not doing what God told her to do concerning her husband, and another one has to do uh, with you not doing what your authorities tell you to do. That's found in Romans chapter 2. It all has to do with what people see when they see you. Now, a lot of people don't know this, but when you broke away from Southern Baptists and created Independent Baptists, this is your heritage, because the Southern Baptists had, gotten, had gone from being extremely conservative. They were more like you are now. When they first started, Southern Baptists were considered to be oddballs, strange, unusual, odd ducks, because they taught salvation by grace through faith, and they taught eternal security. And most of them believed in the second coming of Christ and the rapture premillennial. Now, their schools got involved and started teaching the white horse rider in the book of Revelation, wound up being uh, uh, Jesus Christ instead of the Antichrist. And then the next thing you know, they started bringing in the kingdom, and their doctrine changed. But initially... When the Southern Baptists started out, uh, they were pretty high and tight, you might say. I mean, that was their attitude. They were the ones that were the best expository preachers of anybody that was preaching at the time. If you go pull up those old guys, all those old guys were Southern Baptists. A lot of them were ordained Southern Baptists, and they were all good expositors. They were really good at teaching the Bible while they were preaching the Bible, verse-by-verse verse exposition is where the whole thing started. And they were real conservative. Haircuts, hemlines, pants, pork, the whole nine yards. I mean, they were trying to assuage the tide that was running into the hippie movement. Late 50s, early 60s, and Woodstock and all that other kind of stuff. Vietnam going on, the hippies going around. And they took a strong stand against it. I mean, to the point of really getting involved in the thing. But over time, they got worn down, and they started talking about women preachers, and they started talking about uh, changing them, having a more uh, uh, liberal approach, and they went from being conservative to being moderate. That's, they literally called the convention moderate. 
And then they went from moderate to liberal. So you had three divisions in the convention, and that was a conservative group, a moderate group, and a liberal group. And now you're at a position where 90% of it is liberal. The ones that run it, the presidents and so on and so forth, they're liberal. They're, they're, they're strange. They're in for uh, uh, making... Uh, making um, Oh, what's the word I'm trying to look for? Uh, peace with uh, homosexuality and being nice to them and being kind to them and, and those kinds of things like that. I'm not for treating, mistreating them, but you got to be careful. Yeah. You're teaching something contrary to the Bible. And then they started having a problem with the women and thinking, well, you know, we can't say the women can't be a preacher. And then they changed the Bible from, from what the Bible says to deaconess. And, well, if we go to this root word and we go to that Greek word, then we find this word here. It's but, but they're lying to people because they're not using the Greek the way the Greeks intended to be used. But that's another class. What began to happen was, just so that you know and understand, the independents began to see a relaxing of the standards at which a Christian ought to live. Now, the independents took it as most people do when they first get into certain things. They have a tendency to run way, way far to the right. And so the independents went even further than the Southern Baptists did in their beginning. And your, his, your history is, is that when people first came in, it was all about the outward appearance. Because the Southern Baptist, you'd been jeans and a t-shirt, and then the next thing you know, it was shorts and halter tops, and then the next thing you know, you're doing just about everything, wearing a bikini to church. They didn't care. It didn't make a difference because they didn't make an imprint. Well, the independents went way to the other side of that thing, and they started trying to help different people do different things. Now, you have to understand this because when I show you the things that are in the Bible, there's a balance to it. You know uh, a soldier because of a uniform that they wear. They require a certain standard of living. Uh, you know a policeman by a uniform that they wear because they require a certain standard of living. You go to a hospital, you can recognize nurses. They're dressed a little bit differently than the people that are what we used to call orderlies, but the people that, that clean and do the maintenance and stuff like that. Uh, you see a guy with a mop and a broom and pushing a cart around, you know that's not the guy that's going to be giving you a shot or the woman giving you a shot. And then you can tell a definite designation between the nurse and the doctor. You go to a dentist office. You can tell right off who the dentist is, and you can tell who the dental hygienist is, and you can tell who the receptionist is. We practice the distinguishing marks of different things in life, and then when you come to church, you're considered to be the Antichrist if you say a Christian should be living a separated life and shouldn't be so much like the rest of the world that now you sound mean and now you sound like you're, you don't want people. No, we want everybody, but at some point, you should be able to adorn when he talks about the doctrine of Christ. What he's saying is, is that your walk matches your talk. Yeah. You're not trying to act like something that you're not showing that you are. So in other words, if I'm a Christian, it stands to reason I shouldn't look like the rest of the world. I shouldn't be like it. Now, you've been out in the world and you got uh, certain marks that sin has brought on you and things like that. Okay, how about making an effort to cover those things up? Why is it that the church is always considered to be bad people when we say to you, you know what, you ought to up your game a little bit. You do for a funeral. You do for a wedding. You do for a job interview. You let your job tell you what you can wear. My job told me for nearly 20 years what I could wear. I mean, told me how to cut my hair, how to cut my mustache, told me what I could wear, what I couldn't wear, what I could put on my uniform, what I couldn't put on my uniform. They had the audacity to think that the car that they gave me, they had a right to inspect it. Yeah, sure. How dare them? It's my car, you know. It's like a kid with their room nowadays. You can't come in my room. My dad would have removed the door off the hinges if I had ever been stupid enough to say that my room under my roof. And nowadays, kids are like, you know, well, I have a right. You do. Die and pay taxes and you have a right to leave if you don't like it. See, that nowadays it's like, well, you know, things are real different now, preacher. I, you know, you got to change some things and it's not. No, no, you change it if you want to change it. But if I'm paying for it, then you're going to do with it what I suggest you do with it. That goes for your phones and your iPads and your iPods and your eye, everything else. And when it comes to the clothing, you're not, dressed, you're not going out like that. I remember we used to work at the, the concerts and stuff like that, all the extra stuff that I had to do and, and sometimes was in charge of. And you see kids get out and they'd have bumper stickers on their cars from their parents, talk about churches and things like that. I always thought that was odd that 
people that were claiming to be Christians were dropping their kids off at a rock and roll concert. Now, in my day, rock and roll concert, I'm not talking about Beach Boys and stuff, although we had them here at Metro Park. I'm talking about Ozzy Osbourne and ACDC and uh, Kenny Rogers and that redheaded girl that would sing with him and uh, all, all of those uh, 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 people that were here. Uh, and so they, they pull up there and then they get through the line there and come through security and then they disappear into the bathroom and they come out looking like something the cat drug in. Yep. They would put their clothes in their purse and stuff and, and then, you know, they would go in and change clothes and then go be like everybody else at the concert. And then at the end of the concert, they'd run back in the bathroom and change and come back out and mom and daddy would pick them up. I several times was tempted to say, uh, you're uh, dressed different there. What happened to you? But I tried to stay out of those kind of troubles. But that's how people are. People nowadays, they say, well, you know, I'm coming to church. You ought to just accept me like I am. Really? You change for everybody else. Yeah. We went in a restaurant the other day, and it had nothing, didn't say anything at all about a mask. But you know what it still had on the door? No shoes, no shirt, no service. Well, I got news for you, ladies and gentlemen. If I'm going to a restaurant, I don't want to sit over here with a shirtless... You know, to me, that's like a wordless book. It's like, that's, that's disgusting to me. I don't want to sit here and look at your armpits dripping sweat while I'm eating dinner. That's right. But the misunderstanding can be that you can think that because I dress up, look nice on the outside, that you're spiritual. No, the Pharisees were the best dressed people of their days. So you see the balance? The outward doesn't make the inward. But he is going to show you some things and he's going to tell you they're doctrinal in nature and that if you're going to have the right kind of doctrine, in other words, display the things that are going to show you here about the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, you ought to be living like he's coming. Amen. People ought to be saying, well, if he's coming, why do you keep doing what you're doing? Why are you living like you're living? Why are you dressing like you're dressing and going where you're going and talking like you're talking and fooling around with all this stuff that you do with social media and with all the other kinds of things, watching what you watch and listening to what you listen to? This has to do with a manner of conduct. The Bible calls it sound doctrine. Now, just very quickly, and you can do with this whatever you'd like to do with it, and I'll let you decide it's your choice. When that child is growing up, you do not let that child just wear whatever he wants to wear. It's 30 degrees outside and they got on shorts and a t-shirt. If you have any sense at all, you're, you're going to change clothes. But then when they get older, you all of a sudden say, well, I guess you're old enough to pick and choose. If that's the case, how come it is that both the boys and the girls wind up dressing to attract attention instead of be pleasing the Lord? There's only one reason they dress that way. It garners attention. That's called biblical doctrine, ladies and gentlemen, and I know it's making you uncomfortable, but you're not supposed to be dressing to it. Now, it doesn't mean you have to run around in a burlap sack. You can be attractive without being a uh, uh, attention grabber. There's a passage about that over in Proverbs. We won't go there. All right, now notice. Verse number 9, we're there. He talks about sound speech. That sound speech that cannot be condemned has to do with somebody being honest and upright. Uh, Look at uh, 1 Peter 4 real quick. That has to do with somebody not being uh, slick, not being uh, conniving, not being a a con man is the word I'm looking for. Uh, Talking straight. Not, not slippery, slidey, not, you know, the Bible talks about uh, using sometimes, using flattery. Uh, flattery is where you're telling somebody something for the purpose of obtaining something. Do you understand? It's not telling somebody something true, you look nice today, and, you know, that kind of a thing. It's utilizing words in order to obtain something. It's like a a salesman that's trying to sell you something, and the product itself doesn't stand on its own. So they begin to talk about what benefits it would be to you in order to get it. You can always tell people like that. They have a tendency to, to not really look at you when they're talking to you. They'll shake your hand, and they're looking over here. They're looking for some kind of an end. Now, he says in that passage that when these people speak evil of you, that when they start doing the investigation, they shouldn't be able to find evil of you. 
They shouldn't be able to go to your social media and pull up things that prove that what they're saying is true. He doesn't say they're not going to say speak evil of you. He said when they do, make them have to dig. And when they dig, they can't find evidence of you living that way. He says in Luke 17, it is impossible, but that offenses will come. Woe unto him to who they come. Better for him a millstone be hung about his neck and cast into the depths of the sea than to offend one of these little ones. So he says offenses are going to come, but in this Titus chapter 2 passage right here, he says, listen, they're going to try to speak evil of you and lie, but when they go at it, let them be the ones that get discouraged because they can't find evidence to support their conversation. He didn't say the accusation wouldn't come up, but if they have to prove it, it's not there. In court, they call that hearsay. That's inadmissible. Well, I heard. Doesn't matter. Get out. Well, but I just, no, it's hearsay. You don't get to do that. You have to have support for what it is that you believe, for what it is that you're saying. So he's saying that when they come to you, he said, make sure that they don't find anything that's, uh, been, that, that backs up what their statement is. That's the reason for living the right kind of life all the time. Not live in one way in church on Sunday and another way Monday through Saturday. That's how do you conduct business. The same way as if I was conducting business with the trustees or the deacons or the people in the church, I conduct my business that way with people that are unsaved people. It's across the board. I'm, I'm not just, uh, when it's beneficial to me, I'll play the Christian card. You know, I'll throw the Bible on the desk and I'll put up the Jesus picture because they have a Christian that's coming in. And so I'll go ahead and do that because it'll be beneficial to me. They'll throw some money across the plate. It's across the plate all the time. Honest in all your dealings and stuff. Now, you may not have been around long enough to have experienced that. But if you've been in your over, say, 50 years of age, you've experienced people that the rest of the world refers to as hypocrites. The rest of the world says they only utilize that Christian thing when it's to their benefit. It's like uh, a Sunday morning Christianity is what I'll call it. No Sunday school, no Sunday night, no Wednesday night, no Bible during the day, during the week, no Bible, no, no fellowship with the Christians and all that kind of, just kind of keeping my membership in good standing so that it's beneficial in the community. Years ago, when somebody would come to the church, they would come not to this church, but to churches all across America. They would come to a town and they would join the church based upon uh, business or finances. And they would go to the church if they were, say, in the jewelry business or they were in the construction business or whatever. They would conduct their business in the church. And they would join the church that would benefit their business. And they would stay in good standing. You may not know this, but years ago, now this would be in the 50s and early 60s, when you went to get a loan from a bank, they asked you who, what your church membership was. Even though there's supposed to be separation from church and state. They would ask you, what church do you go to? Or are you a member of a church? And what are you? Back in the old days, a long time ago, not just the Southern Baptists, not just the Independent Baptists, uh, the Catholics, the Charismatics, the Church of Christ, all the other ones would have you sign a thing at the, uh, on the bottom that when you signed, you signed a covenant with people. I won't do this and 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 I won't do this. You join the church, then you go out and you're representing the church out there. Well, here you're not representing the church, you're representing Him. Amen. But you have to recognize, ladies and gentlemen, you're going to run into people that call themselves Christians, but they're no more Christian than a billy goat. They're saved, but they don't live like that. That causes blasphemy. That causes uh, disrepute, ill repute on the Bible, mocking, belittling, making fun. There's nothing worse, would you agree with me, uh, for a preacher to be preaching, and then he stands around, smokes and drinks, and runs around with women. You'd say, well, man, what in the world? What kind of preacher is that? A bad one. Well, what kind of Christian is that that does the same thing? But the difference is nowadays you may not smoke and drink and do those kind of things, but you may uh, maybe steal somebody's, uh, purloin somebody's reputation. He says not purloining. Why does he put that in there? That's taking somebody's reputation from them, using it for your benefit. Talking about people. It's likened into plagiarism, taking things and claiming it was all you. It's about reputation. It's about claiming, you know, uh, uh, look at what I did and look at those kind of deals. It's what he's trying to get across here in the passage. Now, when he talks about they're going to speak evil of you, he says this to you because it's coming. First Peter 4, and then we'll get on back into it. Verse uh, 12, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you. But rejoice inasmuch as you're partakers of Christ's sufferings, 
that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. That has to do with the second coming of Christ there. If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, that's a good thing. Happy are ye. For the spirit and glory of God resteth upon you. On their part he is evil spoken of, but on your part he is glorified. But, this is the rough part. Let none of you suffer as a murderer, or as a thief, or as an evildoer, or a busybody in other men's matter. Yet if any uh, man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on his behalf. Did you see what just happened right there? Right there with murderers, right there with evildoers, are individuals that are called busybody. Evildoers are people that speak uh, unjust evil of you just for the sake of talking about you. Your society nowadays garners that. People don't even have to have evidence to prove that you've done anything wrong or improper. They just put it out there. And they just, this is just what I want to say. And then they just say it. They have nothing to back it up. Here's what's worse. People actually listen to it. They, they don't even go verify whether or not it's true or not. They just propagate it. They just spin it and sell it out there. Titus chapter number 2. Now he goes on to say this in verse number 9. And this has to do with an authority issue. It has to do with keeping rank. It has to do with keeping things in the proper order. There is nothing that will test your Christianity faster than the, the issue of authority. There is nothing that will test your Christianity any quicker than the issue of authority. It all is based on who you're getting orders from. Are you willing to do what God tells you to do? In the Old Testament, they call it keeping rank. David says, I had several men that were working with me, and they were mighty men and men of valor, but these are all they which could keep rank. In other words, there's a rank, there's a protocol, there's a process to things. It's not everybody in the pot together and everybody is on the same level. It's everybody is doing that part in the body that they're supposed to do. It's not trying to grab the wheel of the ship and run it the way you want to. Now notice what he says in verse number 7. In all things showing thyself a pattern of good works. So you're, you're setting an example. Is that a fair interpretation of that? Verse number 9, exhort servants to be obedient unto their own masters. You know what that has to do? That's telling somebody you're teaching them proper doctrine when you tell them to do what they're told to do. There's nothing worse than having an employee that you're constantly having to explain yourself to when you ask them to do something and you're paying them. And you're explaining yourself as the boss why it is you want it done a certain way. You take an individual that used to work, say, at uh, McDonald's, and they find out that they're not doing such a great job there, so they go to work at Burger King. And at Burger King, it's have it your way. And the guy says, well, you know, when I was at McDonald's, it was two all beef patty special sauce, lettuce, cheese, pickles on a sesame seed bun. And so he starts stacking extra buns on there and putting a piece of bread in there. And the manager comes in and said, what are you doing? And he said, I'm making hamburgers like I want. Yeah. And he said, we don't sell that here. And he said, well, but the place I used to work at, this is how we made them. And he said, you don't work there anymore. You work here. Well, but you're going to have to learn and understand that I come with these new ideas and your, your uh, uh, business here exists so that I can have a job. And so you're going to do it the way I want to tell you to do it. You're probably going to find yourself an unemployment line. But the mentality is, from a spiritual perspective is, is that when it comes to authority, it's a matter of where's the chain of command? As bad as you hate to hear that. There is no order. The devil likes to do things uh, opposite of the Lord, who does things decently in order. The devil likes to have chaos. Who is he to tell you? Who is she to tell you? Who do they think they are? Why do they think this? Why do they think that? What's the problem? The problem's authority. I just don't believe anybody ought to be in that position right there. Well, unless it's you. Oh, and then if somebody questions you, you're going to drop the hammer on them. Right? Sledgehammer. But you sit back and, well, if I was running it, I wouldn't, put, I wouldn't put Brad over that. I mean, why does Brad have to be over that? You say, well, I, don't, I, don't, I, 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 I wouldn't say that about Brad. I bet you say that about some. You say, why? It has to do with authority. You know what that causes? That causes your testimony to be blasphemed. Yeah. You're out there trying to talk to somebody about winning them to the Lord, and all they hear is you talk about all the discontent and malcontent that you have with people in the body of Christ. Yeah, and talking about preachers and talking about the guys getting up here and who it is that teach Sunday school or builds the building or cuts the grass or whatever it might be. 
Now, he wouldn't put this in the Bible if it wasn't true. You know what he says? He says, if you're going to do what's the right thing to do, you know what you tell servants? Do what your boss tells you. We say, that doesn't apply now. Well, what do you call yourself? Don't you work for somebody? Amen. You have a boss, don't you? Yes, sir. The context of everything in here, I could take you to court on it and win it. Yeah. It has to do with authority. Yes, sir. You're not tight this morning because of rain. You're tight this morning because we don't like to be told what to do. Amen. We don't like it. We're naturally mavericks. That's why the Lord comes along there in Romans chapter number 12. And in Romans 12, He said, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your body a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed. How? By the renewing of your mind. Why? So you can learn something, that you may know that which is good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. You know what the perfect will of God is, ladies and gentlemen? I mentioned this to you the other night before I left to go up to Tennessee. You know what the perfect will of God is? It can apply across the board to anybody. Anybody can do it. Black or white, male or female, young or old. It makes no difference at all. Any one of you can be in the perfect will of God right now, this minute. You say, what is it? It's doing what God says to do, when God says to do it, the way God says to do it. Amen. That's the perfect will of God. The perfect will of God is not a calling that only applies to preachers or pastors or missionaries or people that have some special talent that seems to distinguish them from other people. The talent is not the perfect will of God. It's am I using the talent God gave me how God wants me to use it. And if I'm not, I'm not in the perfect will of God, even though I may have an ability or may be gifted to do whatever it might be. Sometimes you can be uh, out of the will of God uh, uh, preaching as much as you can not preaching. Sometimes God says, sit down and shut up. And you're like, but Lord, I got a message. And the Lord says, I know you have a message. <laughs> and you don't need to preach it. See, our concept of how we see things, ladies and gentlemen, is, is we don't really see things as they are. We see things as we want them to be. That's called human nature. And what you do is, is that you start looking through those eyes and then the next thing you know, you become a legend in your own mind and then you run without authority. You know what the devil's problem was? You say, well, it was pride. Okay, that's getting close. But you know what that pride did for him? You're not going to tell me what to do. I will set my throne above your throne. I'll be like the Most High. You ain't going to tell me what to do. Right? <laughs> Who would have thought there's a little bit of Satan in all of us? You know what he just covered in 1 Peter 3? We won't go back over that thing, but you know what he covered in 1 Peter 3? He said, if you women are married to a man who doesn't obey the word, they may without the word be one while they behold your chaste conversation Amen. coupled with fear, Amen. whose adorning let it be not the outward appearance of the man, the plating of the gold and the braiding of hair and so on and so forth, but let it be the hidden man of the heart and the meek and a quiet spirit. You say, what is it? If any man obey not the Word of God, they're supposed to learn from you by watching how you act. I'm in the Bible. Yeah. You mean they're watching my... Yeah, they're not listening to what you're saying. They're watching what you're doing. Amen. Why does she keep doing that? She fears the Lord. She's afraid of the Lord. She wants to do what is pleasing to the Lord. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Oh, I see. What does it have to do? Obedience. See? That's a difficult thing. I'll show you this. You get ready to get saved. You're tired of sinning. I'm tired of sinning. I want to turn around. I've had enough. I'm, I've had enough. You, you repent. You turn your back. I don't want to go to hell. I want to go to heaven. That's not salvation. You've just turned around. The Lord says, okay, come unto me, all your labor and heavy laden. Well, the way I see it is, it's authority. See? Well, I'll get there, you know, when I live it. You ain't never going to live it. You start getting into passages and stuff like this toward the end of your New Testament and the end of the Pauline epistles and you start recognizing, my goodness, man, I'm messed up as a soup sandwich. Amen. And you think, you know, I'm doing pretty good because I'm not doing what I used to do. And the Lord's like, you ain't even getting started. You're in the first grade. I was listening to the old preacher the other day when I was flying out and I was listening to him teach the book of James, just going through verse by verse and teaching and stuff like that. I got under conviction sitting there in that airplane 
And I thought to myself, man, I ain't no more qualified than a billy goat to teach after listening to what that guy taught back in the 80s. And I've taught through James, I don't know how many times. I've taught through it several times, thought I knew it pretty good. And I'm sitting there listening and he's rolling stuff out, rolling stuff out, rolling stuff out, rolling stuff out, rolling stuff out. And I'm thinking, my goodness gracious, man. How did I miss that through the first few times? The Lord said, well, you have a, a problem. I couldn't show you those things because you have an authority issue. Yeah. I can only get you to do what I can get you to do, but if you reject the truth, then all of a sudden I just turn the spigot off. All right, come to Titus again now. What he says there is, is that we're supposed to be uh, telling the servants to be obedient to their own masters and to please them well in all things, uh, not answering again. Then he says, not prolonging. That's, that's stealing. Showing all good fidelity. Fidelity is a word. Marine Corps has a word called simplify. That's always faithful. Uh, poor learning is more than just stealing towels from a hotel. The old story is that somebody broke in our house and they took the TV and the jewelry and all of our Holiday Inn towels. <laughs> Purloining is stealing. It's, uh, it's taking something and not leaving an adequate return. Paper clips from the office you didn't pay for. Time from your boss. You ever take something that God gave you and use it for your use instead of what God wants you to use it for? He says, not prolonging, not stealing, not taking something. Notice he says, good fidelity. You know what good fidelity is? It's can you be trusted? Can you be trusted? Fidelity is faithful. Can you be faithful? You ever look at that boy named Lazarus? Lazarus is over there in, in uh, John chapter number 11. And he pops up on the scene there and said, Lord, the one that you love is going to die and so on and so forth. And the Lord said, okay. And he waits till after four days and they say, Lord, he's dead. And the Lord said, okay, he's dead and I'm glad. And I guess we'll walk on down there and that kind of thing. And then Lazarus comes out and uh, Lazarus comes out of the tomb. Now, here's what I want you to see in that. What sermon did Lazarus ever preach? He wasn't one of the apostles. He wasn't a prophet. He never built a building. He just always showed up. He was just always there. He just there. That's all he did. Riding a pew. What was he? Bible don't say he was anything. Only thing is, is that after he came up, after he was resurrected, he was always around Jesus. And the Bible says that the Pharisees were trying to kill him as much as they wanted to kill Jesus just because he came up. You know where they found him? With Jesus. You say, why? Faithful. Just faithful. Now, you don't tell me you don't appreciate faithfulness. Yeah. Your wife goes to work and you appreciate her coming home in the afternoon, don't you? Sure, sir. Ladies, you appreciate your husband coming to the house, don't you? Don't tell me you don't appreciate faithfulness. Well, how about your faithfulness to the Lord? Well, preacher, I can't preach a sermon and I can't sing a song and I can't do the money and I'm not a treasurer and I'm not a trustee. I don't hold a position. I'm not somebody that's special and all that. Can you just be faithful? Lazarus was. Lazarus had a great testimony. What a thing. You die, the Lord resurrects you. He doesn't even come out and talk. He doesn't even give a testimony. He doesn't say anything. He's just there. People tell me all the time, you know, well, if you, uh, we just heard of the people a couple of weeks ago. I keep reiterating that. You know, well, if God saved you, He didn't save you to sit on a pew. Maybe He did. Maybe Lazarus just needs to sit on the pew. Maybe you come from a place where you've been road hard and put up wet and beat like a rented mule and you come in and you just need some time to sit down, settle down, learn some Bible and enjoy a little bit of rest and relaxation until the Lord opens up the door and maybe puts you in the harness. Maybe you're in the harness by just listening. Maybe you're encouraging me and don't even know that. I don't want to quit. Well, you know, I'm getting an old preacher and I can't do this and I can't. You're doing a lot. You're sitting here. You're just here. And I, just, I just go to church. You just go to church. You realize how many people are watching you go to church? I get wore out with people that think you've got to always be doing something, always be doing something, always be doing something. Doing something ain't for everybody. Sometimes you just... I've been resurrected to newness of life. I'm saved. What are you doing for the Lord? I'm just going to church right now. I'm trying to get in the habit of reading my Bible and praying and putting up with the brethren and just coming to church. Not going to let anything get in my way. With all fidelity. Can He trust you with it? 
Here's one for you. Can he trust you with trouble? That's a tough one. He's given you the greatest gift this side of eternity when He gives you trouble because we're the only group saved individuals that wind up getting to rule and reign with Him because of our trouble, right? Because of our persecution, because of our trials, because of the tribulation. We get a reward for that. We get to rule and reign. Is that right? Can He trust you with trouble? Or when the trouble comes, is it going to be, why me, why me, why me, why me? Why me? The Lord's like, well, I entrusted you with it. Are you going to be faithful in trouble? You don't know if you're faithful until the weather's bad and things are difficult and things are hard and your flesh don't want to go and you say, I'm going anyway. You don't know if you're going to be faithful. You'd like to be faithful. You're going to be faithful without a pay paycheck? You're going to be faithful to your husband or your wife even if they're acting like they ain't got no sense? Or the woman's going through whale of pause. I don't call it menopause because there ain't nothing little about it. It's a whale. If your wife hadn't been through it yet, then just you just sit there and grin because you don't don't say, oh, that can't be nothing. Okay, we'll see. Some of you will change your theology and think you're in the tribulation, especially your wife. Man, she goes through stuff. She can't even figure it out with a figure machine. Reads all the books on whatever it is and comes out on the other side of it and goes, I still don't know what it is. <laughs> Can he trust you with trouble? How about trouble with your family? How about trouble with your friends? How about trouble with your finances? Can he trust you with it? I'm going to be faithful. That little old woman sitting back in that back corner over there, I can see her now at East Lake Baptist Church, way back in that corner. She sat over there 90-something years of age. Come down that aisle singing, I am satisfied, I am satisfied, I am satisfied with Jesus. I've told you that story a bunch of times. I think about Miss Penny going out. Preacher, I'm going to be all right. You need to get a hold of yourself. I think about an elderly woman that came to a meeting a few weeks ago, and she came to a youth meeting. She's in her 90s. And her family said, don't go, don't go. You shouldn't be going. What are you going to do with all those kids and stuff? Like she said, I am going to church. And if God kills me with COVID, then I get to go home to heaven. And if not, I'm going to go to church. Y'all stay home if you want to stay home. But I belong on a pew. Now, I'm not, you do what you want to do. Don't go out here. See, he, he got to bring it up. Could you just pipe down for a second? I'm not trying to tell you to endanger yourself. That's the testimony of a lady in Detroit. And she came to a youth meeting because she got a chance to get in on a meeting other than just on Sunday, and she wanted to go. And she couldn't drive. You know what she said? If y'all don't take me, I'll find somebody to take me. What is that? Just faithful. She's old. She just sat over there. Right there. She just sat there. Just grinning. <laughs> I don't know if she heard half of what I said. He said when I got a little bit cranked up. I don't know if she heard all that kind of stuff. You know what I appreciated? I finally asked. I said, preacher, he goes, oh, that's Miss So-and-so. She's been here for years and years and years and years. He said, she just had it out with her family. And I said, what, over what? And he said, overcoming the church. She said, I'm going to church. I don't care. Y'all stay home. It don't make no difference to me, but I'm going. She said, he said, she's got all kind of pre-existing things going on. I said, well, maybe she's like that lady down there in Pensacola that said, stop praying for me, I want to go home. <laughs> she went to the hospital and she was doing pretty bad and they all got together and prayed, oh God, oh God, oh God, help me, deliver me, oh God, help me, and that kind of thing. And then she got better and she got out of the hospital and then she turned around and went back in the hospital. And she started getting worse again, and so they started praying. She got better. She didn't get out of the hospital. And the preacher went in to see her and said, Hey, how are you doing, sister? And she said, uh, uh, Brother Pete, I'm doing okay, but I need to ask you a favor. He said, Sure, what's that? He said, uh, Could you please do me a favor and tell the people to stop praying? I'm ready to go home. <laughs> and she died. Amen. So that's a coincidence. Okay, whatever. You got an answer for everything, don't you? I wouldn't call you a smart aleck, but I sure think it. You're always trying to undermine things God's trying to do. I'm talking about just being faithful. Amen. Just being faithful. You know what somebody else's faithfulness is is not your business. It's are you being faithful. 
Don't tell me you don't appreciate it. Any of you has ever owned a business or anything? Don't you appreciate an employee that shows up every day? Nowadays, if you find an employee that shows up to work, mm -hmm. I mean like a living, breathing person standing upright, it's like, wow, give them, give them, give them a raise. They showed up to work three days in a row, <laughs> right? And do you not think that if we take pleasure in that, in the human realm, that God doesn't take pleasure in that? Let me give you this real quick. We got a couple of minutes. Look in verse number 10. He said, uh, uh, good fidelity. And then he says this, but they that, are may, uh, that they may adorn the doctrine of God, our Savior, in what? What does it mean to adorn the doctrine of God? The passage is about doctrine. It has to do with how you live. And you're supposed to do it across the board. Adorning the doctrine of God is the idea that if you're in subjection and obedient, like in 1 Peter 3, we've already talked about that, and doing those things, that the biblical doctrines that deal with righteousness and holiness don't sound blasphemous to people when you're the one talking about righteousness and holiness. Why would somebody think it'd be bad for you to talk about righteousness and hol holiness unless they see something in your life that doesn't exude righteousness and holiness? Who wants to talk about righteousness and holiness anymore? Who wants to talk about living right anymore? Look in verse number 12, it supports it. Verse number 12, what does grace teach you? There are six things that you get taught here in verses 12 and 13. Notice, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts. Tell me it has nothing to do with con uh, your, your uh, conduct. It does. It's directly associated. The doctrine of God is your conduct. Adorn the doctrine of God. I got to live it. Not to get saved, but to be a good testimony. What does grace teach us? The same grace that saved you, that grace of God right there would be Jesus Christ. Bring the salvation at the pier to all men. Jesus saves, right? What does grace teach you? It teaches you not only salvation, but that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. You know what he says? He says six things there that if God's grace is on you, those six things ought to be evident in your life. That's what he said. Denying ungodliness. You know what an ungodly person is? That's a person who is operating without God. That's a person who's saying, I don't need God. I doesn't appreciate what God's done for him. That's a person who says, listen, ungodliness is not just wickedness. He says ungodliness. And then he goes on to define five other things that if you're adorning the doctrine of God, you shouldn't be connected with those things. And you should be living your life as if Jesus Christ is coming. Now, I don't want to be hard on you. I don't know when the rapture is going to happen. And I believe you ought to look for the Lord to come every day. I believe if you're ready to die, that you're ready for the rapture. I don't know when the rapture is going to be. If I could figure it out, I honestly, with all my heart, of all the people in the world, I'd tell you. I don't know. I can't figure it out. I don't know if the clock starts when it is crucifixion. And so therefore, you've got to go all the way out to 2033. And then you've got to back up seven or three and a half, whatever you want to back up. You're not going to be in any part of the tribulation. And so then you've only got nine or ten years left. I don't know if the Lord doesn't count the number of the days there and that you could, He could come at any minute and reset the clock. I have no idea. I know this. He tells me me that I'm supposed to live as if he is coming today. Amen. And if I live that way, I don't have to worry when he comes. I think the reason sometimes people are so interested in when is the Lord coming is because they want to live that wicked life, that kind of half in the half out life until the last possible minute as if the Lord's not taking a, a note of what they're living all the time. Amen. You ever been to divorce court? I don't raise your hand. I don't, not, not, that, wasn't intended to, that was intended to be rhetorical. <laughs> you know what happens in divorce court? Somebody finds out they're going to get divorced and they quit their job thinking that the spouse is going to have to take care of them because they quit their job. They don't realize that if you've been married for 15 years, they're going to go back over that 15 years and compile all the... It don't just happen with what you're doing at the moment. Christian, the judgment seat of Christ doesn't just apply to what you're doing at the moment He snatches your hind end out of here. It's a compilation of what you've done since salvation. How are you living? What's your life going to say? Would they say, Peacock, you're adorning the doctrine of God. The way you live, the things you're doing, right in line with what the Bible says. So when you teach something about the Bible, no question. How about you?
I didn't say I am. Something to work for. I'm saying that if every day I can finish my day by saying, Lord, if you come get me today, I'm square. You say, how often you plead the blood? As often as I need to. Amen. You may be different. I do really good when I'm sleeping. I mean, I am as good as it gets when I'm sleeping. But the second I wake up, it starts. And I have to remind me, he could come today. He could come today. Now, why'd you wake up with that thought? Is that that important that you're going to let it redirect all your energy to worrying about that thought or worrying about this or worrying about that? How about you just be careful for nothing and all things with prayer and supplication. Make your request known unto God. I can do all things through Christ that strengtheneth me. How about there's uh, no temptation taking you such as common to man. The Lord will with the temptation provide for you a way of escape. How about you got some other verses in the Bible to that? How about presenting your body a living sacrifice? How about not thinking the way the rest of the world thinks? How about conforming to his image? How about doing that? How about think on these things? Yeah, I mean, yeah. Amen. I like that. Okay, Lord, you're right. I'm, and by the time you're done with your morning coffee, it's like, okay, come get me. Yeah. Come on now before I mess up again. <laughs> you don't pray that? Do you not get up in the morning, ladies and gentlemen? I want to encourage you to do it. Do you not get up in the morning and think, maybe today? Yeah. Maybe today? Yes, Boy, if the Lord takes something that's valuable to you and puts it on the other side of glory, I'll guarantee you it'll change you. Amen. Boy, I'll guarantee you it'll change you. You'll wake up and say, Lord, I've, I've had enough. I'm beat up, I'm wore out, shot out, had enough. All it takes is a phone call. A matter of seconds, change your life just, just like that. And what you thought was important 15 minutes ago, all of a sudden, it ain't no more important than a billy goat. Things just rocking along in life and you're thinking, well, everything's good today. You know, the bills are paid and the horses are in the barn and we're good to go. And then phone rings. We got your results back from your pap smear. Well, I guess everything's fine as usual, huh? Well, need to come in. We don't need to talk to you. Can you just tell me over the phone? No. I hate them. I hate them. Well, okay, I'll be right down there. No, you can come in two weeks. Oh, my aching back. <laughs> Ain't that what they do? They still do that. Yeah. You go in for your exam. Got your results. Okay, you're going to email them to me? No, you got to come in to get them. Well, can't you just tell me on the phone? No. Never when you go in there is it good. That's why they want to see you. I guess they want to see you melt in front of them or something, you know. And you go in there and you're so stinking anxious when you walk in the door. We got your results. Life just changed. Yeah. Just like that. What was important 15 minutes ago, not important anymore. The next thing you know, you're thinking, well, and it doesn't have to be you. It can be somebody in your family or some yeah. friend. Get a phone call from somebody. Brother Monroe passed away. What are you, just a month since we had his funeral? Yeah. Only been a month. Yeah. Monroe passed away? Wasn't he a young man? Yeah, yeah I don't care what anybody tells you. Seventy's young. Yeah. 68 years old. You say, what is that? <laughs> That's a great example for me and you. We don't know how long it'll be. You might live as some as old as some of these older women and men in here. Maybe. You might. And God is healthy as a stinking horse. You say, what? You don't punch your ticket. Yeah. Well, I eat organic and I keep my weight down and I do this and I do that. Mm -hmm. You can't control that. So the best thing for you to do is, if I'm going to adorn the doctrine of God is, I live right and I'm looking for Jesus all the time. Amen. I teach this and I believe when I'm, I'll give you a break here in just a second. I teach this and I believe this. I believe you make every decision that you need to make in light of the judgment seat of Christ, you're going to come out on top. Yes, I believe that. Amen. See, preacher, that just sounds a little that fur-fetched. Fur, F-E-R, fur-fetched. No, it ain't fur-fetched. It makes you ready to go, whether you're a woman or a child or a, an old or a young, and have the year. as soon as you're saved, it makes you ready to go. Car accident. Gone. 
That ain't the time to say, well, I sure hope he was. You're done. You don't get to come back. The story about that in the Bible. There's a man over there in Luke chapter number 16. Rich man and Lazarus in clothing and purple and flared sumptuously every day. And Lazarus laid at the gate of the rich man uh, covered in sores and laid at the gate of the rich man's table. And during the nighttime, the Lord comes over there and both of them kick off. And the rich man, rich man lifted up his eyes in hell. Look how selfish he is. Tell Lazarus to come dip his finger in water and come cool my tongue for I am tormented in these flames. He dies and goes to hell and he's still thinking about himself. And Lazarus is over there has had nothing but a life full of sores and trouble and letting dogs lick him and things like that and trying to help him out and curl up around him and keep him warm and stuff like that. And he dies and one of them goes to Abraham's bosom and the other one goes to hell. And neither one of them, neither one of them knew when it was going to happen. That's right. But they're there now. Yep. And now the rich man has a change of heart and he's like, well, I'll tell you what, if I can't get out... Send somebody to my brothers. You know what the Lord's response was? It's pretty harsh. He said, if they won't believe what's already written, paraphrased, the law and the prophets, they're not going to believe though one, believe though one rose from the dead. Right. I could send them back a dead man. They wouldn't believe him. They take after you, rich man. They're not ready. Boy, a good time to drop that anger and strife and emulation and wrath and seditious behavior and bitterness and, and grief and all that. A good time to drop it's now. You say, why? Today might be your last day. Amen. You want to get up there and have the Lord. The Lord, I still got all this stuff. Of course, why don't you dump that, man? We don't use that up here. Father, bless your word and help us to consider these matters and consider uh, these things that have been said, written so plainly to us by the Apostle Paul, written to Titus and now ministering to us. We'd ask, Lord, that your blessings would be upon what was said. Thank you, Lord, for these folks that have braved the elements today as well as the stuff going on in the world uh, to be here. I pray, Lord, that you'll do something for them that only you can do, and that's feed them from your word today and help them to be full and to go out.